I am Doug Friedman. And I am Meredith Levy. And this is Your Mental Breakdown. The podcast. Made especially for you. No, no, not you. You. Uh, well, okay, for you. Uh, I don't think we made it for love for you. We did for you, but not. It's funnier when you can see Doug and he's pointing. But... <laughs> I have to be careful. I'm still recovering. I, I, didn't, oh, I didn't tell you this. What? I got hospitalized for a, a peekaboo accident. Doug. <laughs> I spent the night in the ICU. <laughs> oh, my God. If I could remember jokes ever, I would tell yeah. that one all the time. <laughs> that is fucking genius. You are oh. the biggest dad on the planet. All right. All right. So kidding so. aside. Yeah. Seriously. Seriously, yeah. though. How you doing? I'm good, actually. Over the weekend, I went to the shooting range with three of my girlfriends and I. Wow. Three girlfriends and I. I, me, three men. Anyway. Yeah, it was super fun. No, no. And there's, there's no me or I. I went with three of my girlfriends. You're right. Thank you. It was fun. I mean, I love, I have a gun that I take to the shooting range and know how to use and keep it properly stored and it's all licensed and whatever, whatever. So my girlfriends and I were trying to think about things to do and we were, we decided we were going to go ax throwing until I found out it's inside at a bar, which I don't mm. see how anybody thinks that drinking and ax throwing is an okay thing to do. <laughs> Ever. I mean, I get, I'm sure right. there are things right. outside, like, but it's so frightening to think that. Indoors at a bar, that's where you do it. Cause that ax throwing sounds kind of fun. I'm not a gun fan. I would, I would not shoot a gun. That's not my thing at all. Yeah. But I would definitely throw an ax. Like, that yeah. It sounds, sounds cool. fun if you're doing it like archery style outside with like some hay right. bales. Right. Like, that's what I picture. Nope. Yeah. It's at a mother effing bar. It's like wow. you can have drinks and throw axes. I'm like, what? <laughs> it's the craziest thing I've ever heard. That is a scary combo. Scary. So it was really fun. If you support guns or not, I'm down either way. Um, but if you do or you never have, or just the one of the girls never had, she was the best shot of all of us. Just tiny little huh. girl. The other two had only like once, right, you know, BB guns, rifles or something. But it was right. It is like can be for people like it's very it can be very empowering i think especially this like little girl she'd never done it before and it was just it just is it's a trip to sort of just like oh that's cool in case of armageddon and there's a gun laying around and you have to protect yourself you know how to do it <laughs> you know what i mean or right. still funny like one of the bullet casings like they fly back at you kind of Landed on one mm. of my friend's boobs, and now she has like a circle, like a little boob, like a little burn mark on her boob. I mean, oh, some wow. funny shit. You have protective stuff on, but I guess we didn't have it on our boobs. Sure. When I was at Calabasas High for a year, went paintballing a few times yeah. with those guys. And I've never that done that. That was a lot of fun. They got so hardcore. Like I had like an Army Navy jacket, like a like a pretty heavyweight jacket. And I had snowboard goggles, but they lent me like a, a dirt bike helmet and things yeah. like, like they were like gnarly hardcore. And I'm like, whatever, it's a paintball. Like, uh, okay, no, you get shot. It leaves a huge welt. I think I had right? one like right on my pack, like a giant welt for a couple of yeah. weeks. Yeah, Hell no. I'm not doing that. That was gnarly. That sounds very scary. Then again, I remember when I was younger and went to the bar with a few friends and we were throwing axes and one of them just kind of stuck in my shoulder and I had like an ax in my shoulder for a couple of weeks. That, that was pretty gnarly. That does not sound fun, <laughs> but yeah, I want to go do archery. Archery looks, it's something that looks like it'd be fun and kind of easy to pick up. So hard. No, it's, it's, it's intense. Like that's, yeah. that's tough. Yeah. yeah. But just, there's like so many, there's a lot of opportunities around that I at least want to do once in my life and don't sometimes just don't think about. And I'm just, you know what I mean? There's, especially here in LA, like take advantage of the year round options outside too. <laughs> right. The wonderful weather year round. Okay. Where are you with uh, skydiving, bungee jumping, cliff diving, those things? I've done them all. Really? You did skydiving? Yeah. Never going to do it again. Did it. Whoa. Really glad I did it. Fucking awesome. 
Can't believe I didn't poop my pants, but <laughs> I did it. And I did bungee jumping off a gondola in Switzerland, very high in the rain. Ooh. It was like rocking back and forth. That was scary as shit. Oof. Hang gliding, fine, whatever. Nice. Cliff diving. I mean, I've jumped a not like a crazy cliff by any means, but like a pretty damn high one. And huh. I have not scared of heights. So I've done all these things just to see if I would, could get rid of it. And nope. Wow. <laughs> That's gnarly. Yeah, I think of things like that that always sound to me like that would be super fun and I could get pumped and, and do it. And that'd be great. And then inevitably I, I start wimping out as it gets closer. Like the, yeah. the <laughs> I had a friend of a friend, not my direct friend, but somebody I knew that went spelunking and did that. I didn't even know what spelunking actually was. And I can see by your face that you don't really either. <laughs> what is it? It's it's when you discover caves. Oh. Like when you go when you go like uh caving or like exploring chasms or a crevasse and you go into it and like it's this whole nope. world. And nope. the guy I was hiking with a couple of people, and one of the guys was a spelunker, like was just featured in National Geographic for discovering something that no one ever knew of. And he's telling me about, yeah, he's doing one in Alaska that's like snow spelunking, like in an ice cave. And I'm just like, nope. that sounds so exciting and adventurous in the Indiana Jones type of way for somebody else to do or me to watch on big screen. Yeah, exactly. No, <laughs> claustrophobia, absolutely not. No scuba diving, no rock climbing, none of that stuff for me. Thank you. I went to the pyramids in Egypt. That was really cool. And we went inside one of the pyramids. And you're going in it and it's wild. Like there's a, there's a ramp that, that takes you kind of, it's weird that you go up to go down and then up again, or maybe it's down to go up and then down again, whatever it was, sure. you know, you're, yeah. you're walking and you go past all these people. And then you're like in the little room where yeah. whoever was buried there, you know, King Tut or whoever it was, was, was there. And you're like, oh, this is it. It's just this little room. And then for me, what dawned on me was it's kind of a ways back out of here. <laughs> What am I doing in here? This isn't natural. This is where dead people go. Like, I'm not dead. Get me out of here. Get me out of here. I, yeah, I did not like it. Duly noted. If I see the pyramids, I'll just stand outside and watch them. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Do you have a bucket list? You've already mentioned like a bunch of stuff. Yeah. You do. Yeah. A lot of it's traveling. Northern lights. What's your number number two place? I don't know. First is Iceland. Northern lights. Second could be Ireland, maybe. You've been talking about Ireland. Ireland for a while. and Russia and slash Israel. Like I want to like do the homeland type places. My mom, my, my dad. <laughs> right. I did Israel. I did Jerusalem. That was cool. I think some things sound like they might be fun. I don't know if they would. Like I'd love to go to Alaska and like see the midnight sun, like where it's daytime. Yeah, that all sounds day long. it does sound awesome. Yeah. That could be cool. Or Aurora Borealis, like seeing that, right? That's what I just said. No, you said the Northern Lights. Same. <laughs> Fuck off. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> like that does seem cool. Oh, but I, magic. I don't know. Really, I, I'd rather just hang out with Beckett in my living room. No. Speaking of. Uh... <laughs> oh, speaking of. Do it. Segue. I, I was segue. Speaking of splunkers. Spelunkers, speaking of spelunking, speaking of going down into the depths of a cave, we go yeah. down into the depths with Drew. It's true. Good one. It's true. Good one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Kind of a continuation of what we've been talking about. Man, it's still fresh for me with him, even though I'm hearing this months later, like going through the ER and doing what he was doing and having a heart attack. It's gnarly. So crazy. Yeah. Well, we will step aside momentarily while you guys listen to the session and we will be back with you to break it down shortly how you been been okay went to the er yesterday you did go wait uh, er yeah. or to get checked out by the by the cardiologist yeah so i uh so last week, my dad got me on Cobra. How did that go? You were kind of worried about asking him for that. 
I had a good conversation with him. It was a lot of, um, he understood, you know, there's a lot of understanding there, which was nice. It was like, uh, I'm really not asking for a handout, but I need help. Like, I need help with this. I don't want this just to be like, oh no, now I need all my parents' help again. And then yesterday I called my mom before I went to the ER. She was like, okay, just take the American Express. Like, if you need it, like, just put it on that. And so I was like, mom, like, I really appreciate what you're doing there. But I think what would be better for me is like, I'm going to transfer money out of my account. I'll pay for it. And then by the time rent comes, I can't pay for that. Then let's talk about how we help and and kind of get to that point. Because I'm really trying not to get that handout. Because it's super easy just to swipe a credit card and be like, okay, well, I didn't even feel what that was. Whereas this way, I think it's just better in the sense of still having that like support and backing. But now I'm understanding of how I want to use it. Mm -hmm. So that was really cool. I know that's been a tough thing with your parents. And we've talked before about if I can take the financial dependence away, then can I just have a relationship with them? Even a year ago, you were talking about not wanting a safety net, like not wanting your parents that way. And it was very all or nothing for you. And what we talked about with getting on the COBRA plan and having them help out that is actually a safety net. And what you're talking about with help for rent, that's a safety net. Right. It's not dependence. It's a safety net. It's kind of going, this was unforeseen and this is my heart. And I, I can handle my day-to-day life, but something like this has me like fallen off the tightrope. So I need the safety net there to catch me and then I'll be back on and be fine. Right. I think this is my way of being able to understand finances in a, like, in a better way in my relationship with my parents too and and how that kind of ebbs and flows i think i have more control over it and the way i went about it this way versus just the swipe and go and not think about it because i i think that's been a mantra of my whole life of just i literally swipe a card i don't even think about how much it is same premise of like being covered safety net wise Mm -hmm. it's just a different equation to me and and it makes more sense in this in, in the way of feeling the hurt of like, oh my God, this does cost a lot of money and I'm going to be okay because my parents got my back in the long run. And I want to try to not have that by the time rent comes, I still want to be able to be like, oh no, see, I covered it. I'm good. I like the use of and there, right? That's big. Yeah. There's something about about this that does drive you to be self-sufficient and to take care of things. And I want to make sure it's not black or white. There's another piece of it too, and we've talked about it a while ago about you wanting to be necessary. Yeah, I text my mom every day to create the situation where where she's going to text back. Mm -hmm. I create these situations. And I want to be able to see the difference between creating a situation like that, that's dependence and being necessary, versus allowing somebody the opportunity to do something for you, whether it's to show their appreciation or to be able to pay for something financially because this was unforeseen. And I think the thing I'm still lacking in all of this is when I call my mom kind of after the, after all this shit, kind of wanting to tell her what had happened and just kind of share that experience with her in a sense. Right. And she was all fucked up and didn't have any idea what was going on and asked me four questions the same way, different, differently. And I was like, mm. no, we'll talk about it later. Like, I'm okay. And so I, I think this experience has really shown me that I mean, I've had my community really show up for me in a lot of ways that have been beautiful and and I'm very blessed. And and I really want to even touch on that for a second just to give it the space of where it needs to be. I mean, I really have. like, I really have had a lot of support. I've gotten what I needed from a lot of people without telling them what I needed in this. And that was, it was really nice. And without having to push them away? Yeah, yeah. And being fully just kind of vulnerable of like, I don't know what's going on. I hope for the best, but I am like, I'm just scared. It's not that anything bad's happening. I'm just scared right now. And I was able to be in that moment. Meanwhile, it also sucked that my mom wasn't able to uh, be sober for the day. What if I needed her? What if something really happened? And, And it kind of like made me think that, I mean, I put her down as my emergency contact still. Why? I don't know. I just kind of forced a habit, I guess. I've never put anybody else. Sure. And I kind of thought about that last night and I was like, well, weird. Like if she's fucked up and they call her and Drew flatlining, do you want to pull the plug or not? You know what I mean? And she's the one that has to make that call when she's fucked up. Like, 
Yeah. Yeah. And I know that's very extreme, you know, very extreme. Is it? I mean, the flatlining part might be, but I mean, yeah. what, you're, what you're saying is not extreme. It's, is my mom somebody that I can rely on? Right. And certainly in a medical sense, because you've had a, a medical issue come up, is, right. she, is she somebody that I can rely on for that? Sounds like she's not. Right, right. And so, uh, I don't know, that was kind of an eye-opener, not good or bad, just kind of right. more aware. aware. Right. So, yeah, weird, kind of weird. It's one thing to be adulting and one thing to be independent. It's another to realize, oh, wait, that safety net is also not reliable Mm -hmm. in an emergency or in a medical situation. Wow. And I think what I'm finding, too, is like financially, and I want to quote, unquote, support. I mean, they're phenomenal. Like, I couldn't ask for more, and they're the best parents I could ask for. Cool. And... I think that I'm realizing now that that's not the support in these situations that I want. It's not the, okay, here's infinity money and go take care of it. Right. But it would have been nice to check in and, and just kind of see how I was doing. My dad did, you know, kind of midway through the day. Hey, bro, you're all right. But I, I again, going to the start of this conversation, I'm the one that had to text my mom, say, hey, I'm going to the ER. Hey, this is what's happening. Hey, this is the test they're doing. And it just kind of felt like I was handling the situation. Now is the perfect time to kind of throw a girlfriend into this. She came up uh, to hang out yesterday. It, was our, uh, it would have been our one year. And so we celebrated, you know, and like we're still talking mm-hmm. and like everything's cool. You know, we talked about that. But I'm blessed that she came up. And this was a really good experience for the both of us, I think, too as far as uh, a mile marker in my head. How so? She got me in some good spirits. You know, she lifted me up a little bit as far as, don't worry about it, it's going to be okay. Like, I'm right here. Like, don't, like, it's okay. And and kind of being that, what I need in those situations, you know, we talked about that of not fixing it and not telling me what to do, but just kind of being like, I'm right here. It's okay. There's just a lot going on. There's a lot of commotion. (laughs) I already don't want to be there. I, ch- I go up to the check-in and kind of tell him what's going on and tell her my story. She was like, oh, my God, are you okay? And I was like, yeah, like, I'm fine. Like, I feel okay situationally. Like, yeah, I do have chest pain here and there, but, like, not right now. Like, I don't know how to answer these questions. And so, again, it was nice to have her there to kind of calm me down and be like this, this, and this and help me walk through that. The scary part for me is I got super in my head the way I do. Mm. I start seeing and and being over aware of situations. And so if I walk in and there's probably 20 people there and I'm getting called to the front of the list, like every time I'm like, yo, like what is going on? Like somebody just tell me. Right. And so I'm panicky, panicky. And and then they take me to the back room. We probably sat in the lobby two, two and a half hours ish, ish, maybe one and a half, two hours. That's not too bad for an ER these days. But that's what I'm saying. I'm like, they're moving me along pretty quick, right. you know? Like, <laughs> what's going yeah. on? Yeah. So I eventually get back to, like, my bed. It wasn't even a full room. It was kind of like COVID ward where yeah. it was, like, the, the spacers were out, right? Right. And so I'm at the front entrance of the ambulance area where all these people are coming in and out. Mm. And, I, and I tell the doctor, I'm like, man, like, I think I'm okay. I just need to make sure, like, they told me to come here to get some tests done and make sure, like, everything, my vitals are okay and, like, everything's kind of going, right? But this really isn't helping me. And, like, I'm panicking. My anxiety is, like, through the roof. And, like, I'm breathing heavy. And, like, there's just too much going on. And I'm so in the unknown with myself already that, like, I need help. <laughs> like, I don't, yeah. I don't know if you need to move me. What's going on? I just need help. And so I think the hardest part about yesterday was sitting there and watching. I want to say it's like death was coming in and out of the door, but it, it was, you know, it was like, like a lot of old people. Guy got shot. He was screaming bloody murder, like like screaming bloody murder. Hmm. There's stabbings, you know, there was a crazy dude that was just kind of like all over the place and he had to get handcuffed to the bed and he's sitting there yelling and cussing at everybody. And, hmm. and there's a little girl that comes in and she's suicidal and the cops are being dicks to her and like, it's just not fair. And so I'm mm-hmm. sitting there like like all by myself because like nobody can come back with me, right? Right. And so I'm just kind of sitting there. And they told me they were gonna bring me uh Antivam, an- Avatam. Yeah. You, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, Ativan. you know what I'm talking about. Ativan. For the anxiety. Yep. Yeah. They told me they're gonna bring me that. 
And so I'm just kind of like sitting there, like waiting, like when's this gonna come? Like this really, like this is bad. I feel my hands are all sweaty. I'm shaking. Right. My heart's racing. Somebody please help. Three hours later, they finally came back, and so they uh, they gave me that. And it was weird because I mean we've talked. I'm very kind of against what that is, especially after seeing my mom and, and everything. And I ended up taking it. You know, it was like this is just fucking crazy. I need something. Like please, I, mean, I hope this is it. And so it actually ended up being really nice. Yep. I didn't feel loopy. I didn't feel like I was completely out of it. Right. But I definitely felt like I was calmed down on something. But I thought it was shocking to be so hyped up like that. And then mm-hmm. to be calm. I still believe I don't like I don't want to go down that route at all. But um What's that route? Chemical. I just don't want to depend on anything. You know what I mean? And, and I really don't dependence is different. Yes. And I'm I'm just picking this because I don't know yeah. if they told you enough of what Ativan is or why they were giving it to you and you're shaking your yeah. head. So, I mean, you went there because of the heart event right? and you were going to get your hearts checked out. Meanwhile, you go to the ER and you're right by the entrance. You're seeing people in and out. You're there for a few hours. Anxiety is spiking. Ativan, it's, a, it's called a benzo, a benzodiazepine. It's the class of drug that it's in. And it's like a Xanax. It's geared to lower anxiety. They're meant to just calm the anxiety a little bit and give you that chill feeling. It's almost, almost like for you, what smoking a bowl would do. Mm -hmm. So essentially what they were saying is, oh, you're kind of freaking out. Well, let's let you smoke a bowl real quick. And then, uh, you know, we'll get (laughs) get to you and deal with your heart thing in a little while. So two separate things. Yeah. What most Western medicine does, certainly what a hospital does, is they go, oh, what, what's the symptom? Oh, I know what alleviates the symptom. There's a pill for that. Mm-hmm. And benzos can be very addictive. There are people that become addicted to Xanax or bars or yep. taken out of an, and it builds up in your system and it's hard to kick. If you start relying on it so much, and that's the, the, the chemical dependence we're talking about. If you rely on it so much, like every time I get anxious, I get that real heavy feeling of anxiety that, oh, panicky, I take an Ativan. Then you're not doing anything to help reduce your anxiety naturally. You're chemically taking something. And there's the nodding. Right. Exactly. I don't think, I don't think it's progressive at all. I, I think that it's very, you plateau. And that's exactly what I don't want. And I mean, honestly, like, I liked the feeling. It was very yeah. like... Oh, this is kind of like euphoric. Like I feel good, right? I feel right. good, and I don't. I do not want to stay in that. Yes, there's addiction in my family. Yes, there's a problem. No, I don't like this. And we've talked about this. Like I don't necessarily like drinking when everybody's out drinking because then I'm a hypocrite because I'm endorsing right. something. Well, maybe you're just having a drink or two, right? And that's okay. And maybe this is. Oh, I'm in an ER, and certainly like having this heart condition, like, I, I don't know what it is. I don't know what it means. Wow, my anxiety is spiking. Here's something this one time that helps with this. But it's not my go-to. They're not giving me a bottle of this. I don't want a bottle of this. But I do want some help right now. Yeah. Well, and, and they gave me nine more. So they gave me nine plus the one I had at the hospital. It's one of those things where I bring it up because, like, it's in the back of my head. Like, this morning even, I woke up and I was like, ooh, like, yeah, I kind of want to take one. And like, I wasn't even like anxious and, and like I had that thought already. And that's why I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. We talked about this a long time ago, that idea of the thought arises. Of course, mm-hmm. of course, that thought's mm-hmm. going to come up and you might even entertain it. Oh yeah. If I took one, I'd be so chill. That'd be really nice. It'd be like mm-hmm. smoking a fat bowl. Like, cool. I could just take one of these and, and get that feeling. That'd be great. Would you actually do it? Sometimes you might, but in this case, like just waking up today, like, no, I don't need that. If I have a big meeting and I'm worried about how it might go, well, wait, then you and I can talk about, yeah, I had a big meeting. I was really worried about how it might go. The anxiety was spiking and I was in the car and like, I've turned around, went home and and took an Ativan and then went back out. Yeah. Like, okay, well then we'll talk about that, you know, because that's relying on a substance for something when it might actually be justified for some people. Mm -hmm. for Mm -hmm. you you're worried about what it might lead to and you don't want to see it progress into reliance or dependence or addiction or any of that it's the extra nine that i'm worried about okay i think i'm completely okay and justified and and like 
I used it for everything it was meant for yep. in the hospital. Yep. And now, and, and I'm not worried in the sense of like, yo, I'm going to go pound all nine of these at once. You know what I mean? And I'm not worried about like, right. like using one, one a day or all nine today. I don't think that's, that's on the horizon. I think it's just more, I like personally want to be strong enough to not even have to think about using them, I think is what I'm trying to say. That will never happen. Hmm. That will never happen. I want to be strong enough so I'll never think about using them. Or never need to or never. Um, I, yeah, I guess. You're, yeah. Okay. I hear you. I know what you're saying. Yeah. Do you? Yeah. Yeah. Because like I still want to do cocaine, but like I, I don't want to do cocaine. I understand that urge of like, oh yeah, that sounds fun. Like that sounds like a good night. The other night when I was out with the boys, you know, we had a beer and I was like, damn, like if we had some Coke right now, like this could really turn into a fun night. And then I was like, hold up. Like, no, 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 no. I don't want to do any of that. I guess it's similar in that sense where it is the entertaining of the thought of it. Right. That I think really thrills me. Yeah. The actual doing it part. No, thanks. Yeah. And the three levels of it, the thought arises, I entertain the thought, I act on the thought. You cannot control the thought arising. It just happens. Man, Coke would be cool right now. What? Why am I thinking that? Oh, I'm such a horrible person. Let me beat myself up. No, dude. Right. The thought popped up. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. When I entertain the thought, yeah, it would be fun. Well, part of the what if game and the balancing when we entertain a thought is, and I'll feel horrible the next day. Uh, mm. And it's not worth it. And it's not really what I want to do right now. Okay. Okay. And that's, that's fine. That's part of the entertaining, the thought. Yeah. Yeah. The acting on, you have a, a filter that stops you. Right. You know, some people don't. Yeah. And some people have that addictive tendency. Your yeah. mom, for one, probably has the thought a lot, entertains it, at least unconsciously, if not consciously. And right. doesn't have the mechanism that stops. So it has become action. It's become habitual. She's become dependent. Her body's used to it. It's a mm-hmm. whole different thing. Right, 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 right. So for you saying, I want to be strong enough to never have that thought. Let's refine that statement if we can. I got you. Yeah, yeah. I'm strong enough to have that thought. Hmm. Absolutely. Because I've had it. I've battled it in that way. Handled it how I wanted to handle it. So, yeah, no, I'm, I'm good. Yeah. And I think I was more beating myself up over the thought of it. Yeah. Especially because of the way I've seen my mom and shit. So, like, I right. didn't want to fall down even the same sign to the pathway. You know what I mean? I didn't want to look <laughs> right. down there. And right. So, uh, <laughs> I, right. Think, I think it's more that conversation. I think, yeah, I think this is another safety net to where I feel it's there if I absolutely need it. Yep. And I'm okay with not needing it. I love that you said it's it's the the sign to the pathway. Like <laughs> if, if if we're gonna call that going like way south, okay. Mm-hmm. That doesn't mean you have to go north all the time. Can I have the strength for that thought to pop up? Yeah. I loved mm-hmm. how you just kind of reframed that. Like, yeah, yeah, I am strong enough to have that thought. I know I'll I'll entertain it. I know where where it'll go and I know I won't do it. Awesome. I had a, a client who was a, literally a rock star and he would have such bad anxiety going on stage mm. that he had an Ativan in his pocket and he was literally, and he was kind of going, yeah, like once during a show, I took it and he's pretty open with his, with his fans so he could tell them yeah. what was going on. But for him, it was having it in his pocket, right. gave him enough security blanket, enough safety net to be okay and now do his thing knowing I had this in an emergency mm-hmm. and he wasn't mm-hmm. popping one every time before he went out on stage at all. Right. So just knowing it's in the medicine cabinet, that might be helpful enough. Yeah. And, and I think that's where I am kind of with weed too. Mm. So, okay. Routine change real quick. Mm-hmm. Instead of smoking before I leave, I've been bringing it with me and I've found I'm smoking a lot less. Yeah. What do you think that's about? So smoking before for me is the preparation of just in case. Uh What if something goes wrong? What if I am nervous? What if I do whatever? Uh, Having it with me is more Boy Scout, I want to say, in this. Mm -hmm. Bringing a tool with me. Right. And kind of having that green beret for the future in that sense. Yeah. Yeah. But I think it's I am prepared if something goes wrong to have it there with me. But I don't need it too prepared to be prepared. 
But just knowing you have that option takes some pressure off. Mm -hmm. Gives a little safety net. So let's back up and keep going because you're you're at this point in the AR. Mm -hmm. They give you the Ativan. You've now yeah. been in the little like <laughs> section of where everybody is for like three, three and a half hours. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Girlfriend. Still outside in the in the waiting area. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Once I took that and I started feeling a little more calm, I was I texted her and I was like, hey, like I know you're still here. Like that thank you for showing up exactly how I need you to show up right now. Right. Cause just having you out there makes me feel more comfortable, right? Now, now that I'm kind of like emotionally stable, let's be a little more rational about it. And so I was like, listen, it doesn't make sense for you to sit here and have to watch all this shit. You go home, go back to the house, and then I'll text you kind of when I'm wrapping up and signing my papers, because it's only 10 minutes away from the house. She ended up going to the grocery store for me because I was completely out of everything. Right. And kind of got the house together and then cleaned up a little bit. And then ended up coming back and waiting again for me to get out. So she kind of took care of some stuff on the back end right. that I really needed to get done yesterday. And she knew that, which was nice. Uh, like, like that took a lot of pressure off of what the day was. Right. So yeah. Yeah. She, okay. Like she, she really showed up yesterday. Yeah. Well, that's good. And it's nice to have that kind of support and that kind of friendship. Yeah. Okay. Is she your girlfriend? Like, yes, but no. Okay. If I asked her the same question, what would she say? Yes, but no. Okay. Okay. Together, though, for sure. It's one of those weird where, like, I uh, I don't want anything else. I don't. It's not like, um, you know, move back in, let's right back where we were type of thing. Right. Kind of like we uh, start ground zero again, which is kind of like I really like that. Okay. And we're working on our friendship on being best friends and what that looks like. And Okay. We'll, we'll come back to girlfriend in a second, but... Mm -hmm. ER. Yeah. Still walk me through that and how that went. Yeah. So the gist of what had happened, they concluded that um, I have no heart disease or heart condition, mm -hmm. but I had a heart event, very mild to light heart attack. Right. That was event based, not like food or anything like that. Like I don't have a bad diet. Like yeah, it was fully sh like a stress situation that caused for what, and it was like a small, like a really small episode. It wasn't like a uh, massive heart attack that left like muscle damage or, or anything crazy. Right. And so that kind of brought me a lot of relief, but it also made me realize how stressed out I really am. And mm -hmm. so to kind of get this thrown in my face right now, and, and that was like what they said. They're like, you're going to keep having these if you continue what you're doing. You know, I smoke cigarettes and all that kind of shit too. So I know that doesn't help. Mm -hmm. And they didn't, like, again, they were like, you're fine. Like, you're 100% healthy. Like, you're okay. You just need to stop stressing so much. Half of me is super relieved. But like, super relieved. Mm -hmm. Maybe 10% of me, you know, that, that almost disappointment piece is almost like, well... Now what? And so I'm happy that I went through the process and game plan, and they still recommend that I see a cardiologist mm -hmm. just to be sure, sure. I need to be smarter about my lifestyle choices and, and how I kind of navigate day to day. And I'm also not going to stop. I, I really thought about it all, like, a lot yesterday. And obviously, you know how like extreme my degrees of things are. I could either slow down, relax, and and do that and almost live a life I hate, or I can continue like with what I'm doing. I might need to make a couple of adjustments here and there, but uh, it is stressful. It is a lot, and it's kind of what I'm signing up for and the way I like to live and like I really enjoy this life. Mm -hmm. And as I was saying that, I realized contradictory to everything I've kind of said is that's my escape to Canada. Yeah, And so... Um, I kind of put two and two together and realized that this is my life. I just kind of got to not get so hung up on working Monday to Monday, take a day or two here and there for myself and mm -hmm. really going to the beach. And, and so even when I'm relaxing and resting and taking a break right now, I'm not. Well, then you're not. Exactly. And right. so I, I think, uh, I think the hard part for me is if I find myself getting a lot of anxiety when I'm not working, because there's so many things going on and there's so much on me right now that I have to make sure everything's moving correctly and everything's in process because one thing goes wrong that I don't know about, it could, it could ruin a lot of other things, domino effect, right? Totally. I'm just trying to figure out how to make space to, to kind of relax and all that too. You like to be the pillar. 
for everyone, yeah. right? Uh-huh. That they can rely on you, that you'll be there, that you can take care of things. Yeah. And we talked a year ago about how stressful that really is. Right. You know, that pillars carry a ton of weight with them, on them. That's what they're there for. Right. And you were like, oh, yeah, it feels like shit. There is some, some sense that sometimes we have of, I want it so that if I go away, if the pillar goes away, the thing crumbles. Like, mm-hmm. yeah, if I'm not there to take care of all these things I have going on, they're going to fall away. So I'm needed. I'm necessary. I'm vital to this. The true mark of a leader is that he can, he can go away and the thing will still be supporting itself. Mm-hmm. It's not just relying on him. Okay, you're nodding. We're, yeah, we're yeah. So at the very beginning of this, you know, I was like the community I found around me right now through all of this mm-hmm. has been so beautiful. I think that's exactly what I'm realizing is that I am taking somewhat of a step away and right. everybody's filling in those holes. Like everybody's filling in those holes of where I need them to. I'm just become, I'm seeing exactly what you're saying. When people talk to me about work-life balance and I say, no, 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 it's not about that. Do you remember what I say? It should be about life balance. It's all life. And it's not work and life. It's all under the umbrella of life. It's work, rest, and play. We need those three elements. We need to do the work because we need to feel like we're being productive, like we're being of service, like we have some purpose, right? For Mm -hmm. sure. Mm -hmm. The rest is seems self-explanatory, but it really is rest. The play is, can I actually have fun? Mm -hmm. Can I feel joy? Can I laugh? The rest part, I I, want to hit that because that's, that seems like it might be important for you. And mm-hmm. it's something we've talked about a little bit in terms of like mindfulness or meditation. Or what does that mean? But rest is knowing and experiencing what it's like to not do anything and just be. Human being, not human doing. Right. right. Whenever you say, I can just go to Canada and fish. Mm-hmm. Like, well... Could you, could you, like mentally, could you do that? <laughs> right. No, I know. That's why I haven't yet. Right. See, that's why, that's why I haven't. Right. Well, and you don't need to go to Canada to fish, to have that experience. I can fish here. Yeah. You can. And we need to find what fishing means and what it looks like here. Yeah, metaphorically. Exactly. If, if we took you and stuck you in Canada right now. <laughs> right, right. Right. Shaking your head. Right. There's too much noise going on. We've talked yeah. about how do I quiet the noise? Like, I mean, you've, you've said like, oh, I just want to go to Malibu and have a beach day. Ah, that would be a version of it. Yeah. Taking you and putting you in Canada on a, on a little boat fishing, you're going to be texting. You're going to be like emailing. You're going to be thinking about all the things you have to do. Like, why is there no Wi-Fi right here? This sucks, man. I got to get this done. Like, no. Yeah. So yeah. I'll call bullshit on you just going to Canada to fish. Like, Okay, metaphorically, go to Canada and fish this week at some point, even if it's just for 10 minutes and see what happens. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. Let's find that gear. Yeah. Yeah. They were knocking on that door. We're getting close. I know. I'm, I'm taking the rest of the day, you know, to kind of hang in. I'm going to try and do a couple of things that I think are relaxing and see where that goes. Next week, I'm going to ask you how fishing's going. We'll check in on this because it's that idea of, I want to go to Canada and fish. Mm-hmm. Let's find what that is. And let's start incorporating that into your life now. Hell yeah. 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 I mean, that's, that's hella exciting. Cool. That's hella exciting. And we're back. Hello. Hi there. We are. Poor Drew. There is a lot going on for him. Yeah, he's been going through it. He really has. His poor little heart. Aw. I mean, it's it's one thing to talk about, like, figurative heartbreak. Like, oh, that breaks my heart. But this is, oh, no, I, I think there is something actually broken about his heart. Yeah. And I think it was a little uh, confusing for me, but I think I, I got it. So, well, he started out by saying how his dad helped him get on Cobra, which was really sweet. He seemed pretty confident in the... It wasn't a handout. It was doing something for him that was a necessity, and he was cool with right. that. Mostly. There's still resistance in him. Like, right. I, I, I use the phrase safety net a lot, and I think he still has a, 
has a reaction to that, which we dig into yeah. a little bit more even beyond this session, that that idea. Well, I was like, so he said he went to the ER and then his mom's like, oh, put it on the credit card. And it was at that point where he said, no, nah, I'm going to just like pay for it. And then, you know, when my rent comes, if I need money, then I'll, I'll ask you. I'm like, when you go to the ER, that's when you're going to do it. That's when you're going to say like, <laughs> like, I'm like, wait, and when do you even pay in the ER? You don't you like pay later. You pay when you leave. I mean, I don't even know, but I was like, what dude, like right. of all times right. to just be like, I mean, it was, right. I, I got the concept for sure. And I understand. And you guys talked about like, allowing someone to do something for you, like un something that's unforeseen an emergency, as opposed to depending on, on somebody. Right. And that, that's just it. That's the heart of it, depending on somebody, because for him, I think he's, he's protesting so much because he doesn't want to depend on somebody that's going to let him down. Right. So it might even, it might be unconscious, like something that's this important I don't want to be let down. I can't be let down. So I'm yeah. not going to depend on them at all. I don't want anything yeah. to do with them. And for mom just to go, oh, here, throw the Amex at it. It's it's what he was saying in this. And for a while, like he doesn't just want their financial support. He wants their emotional support. Yeah. But he's realizing like they're not there for me emotionally right now. Huh. And he even called her and she's fucked up and loaded. Like I know that was so sad. Yeah. So sad and and so poignant when he said, shit, like she's my emergency contact. And right. I'm like, yo, dude, you need a new one or an additional yeah. one. Actually, just a new one. Not because, you know, and he was like, I know that's extreme if I flatline or something, but no, not it's an emergency contact is for anything. Right. And that was such, I think, a poignant moment. You're right. That, yeah. that he kind of realized like, yeah, I just kind of put her down as force of habit. But wait a second. I just had a heart attack. If I'm like flatlining and they need to know if they're going to pull the plug or not, I don't want them calling my mom who might be fucked up. Like, wait a second. That's, huh, maybe I need to find another one. And when he said to me like, oh, I know that that sounds pretty extreme. Like, <laughs> it doesn't. No. It doesn't at all. No, and so curious. She's been like that his whole life. Why not dad? Why mom? It's interesting that we're getting to uncover some of the the dynamic of the relationship that he has with parents when stuff like this is happening. Not just when he's living his regular life and things are fine and things are normal and this is just how they are. It's, oh, wait, when I actually need them for something and there is a literal emergency, where are they? Right. Where's their support? How reliable are they? Yeah. And he had this sort of radical acceptance about his mom, about the, hmm. all right, she's fucked up, whatever. And I think he was like, all right, just bye. Okay. And then later on, he just said, yeah, it really sucks. It really sucks. And sure, financial support, great. Depending on the situation, it can be better than nothing. Sometimes it actually works against people. But at the same time, hmm. having that emotional support, it's, I think, really hard for him because- it's so touch and go. It is a crapshoot with his mom if she's sober enough right. to do it or present right. enough. Totally. And and him kind of walking through that and picking and choosing where he's going to get support. He's come such a long way and he doesn't really see it right here, but he does. Yeah. I think he does get it. And you guys listening certainly see it and hear it. And I threw back at him, like, right, you used to text your mom every day to create the situation where she was going to text back. And he often will defend them and say, oh, they're the best parents I could possibly ask for. And he always says, well, they've always been above and beyond there for me financially. But right. he said, like, and, and I love that he used and, not but. I uh, know. No. Best parents I could ask for. And I'm realizing that's not the support in these kinds of situations that I really want to need. Right. Right. It's interesting. Little little teaser for you guys listening. We are, I am joined in the breakdown next week talking about some of these issues with my mom. <laughs> and she picked up on his feeling. I kind of go with certain things, but his feeling of abandonment and betrayal and the trust that's so big for him. She was like, I can hear it these last couple of sessions, meaning this one and the one next week. She's like, I can right. really hear 
that that emotion is right there and needs to come out. Like he's still holding that. And it's something I, I didn't hit with him here because we're still talking about the ER and what was going on. And, and I'm really focusing with him on individuating and being not codependent and, and how that feels for him and, and how he thinks about that. But that right. emotional piece is huge. It's huge. Yeah. And then girlfriend slash, what is she? Uh, is she your girlfriend? Yes, but no. Well, what would she say? Right. Yes, but no. So funny. I'm like, fair enough. Right. So she, I guess she came up and they celebrated their one year, not one year. Right. Apparently. <laughs> <laughs> I was laughing so hard. Something I would do. Right. And she was totally there for him with the ER. And yep. I'm sure, I don't know, most people know what it's like to wait in an ER for someone else, for your set, you know, whatever it is. It's just the worst. And oh, not yeah. only if you're waiting there, are you waiting for the person that you're worried about usually, but then you're waiting around. And he said like death everywhere. He just said like someone was shot. Oh, there was yeah. some suicidal girl, some guy handcuffed. Like right. it's so right. not pleasant. And she was there for a few hours, left, came back, went and got him groceries. Right. She like right. really showed up. It sounds like. Yeah. And it was an interesting juxtaposition with mom who he reached out to that didn't show up at all. Right. Even though like mom might say things like, oh, I'll come down there right now and I'll take care of everything. Like, no, no, I just need that support that I guess I'm not getting from you. And oh, my girlfriend, not girlfriend is here giving it to me. Right. Okay. And he's coming to a place of being able to take it where he's getting it and recognize yeah. that whether you call her girlfriend or not girlfriend, she is supporting him. She is there for him. And wow, that's, that's something he can rely on at a time when he needed to lean on something and someone. Well, what do you think about taking it where you can get it? I mean, is that taking crumbs? Is that even with her? Cause I know their relationship's been on and off. Like ideally he can rely on her no matter what. Right. Yeah, I, I think we we are all kind of wishing that, oh, this was his girlfriend and this is somebody he can rely on and this isn't somebody that cheated on him twice, right? And it is. What he's recognizing, and this might be a little residue from mom being not really reliable, is that at least her, meaning girlfriend, not girlfriend, her situation, her relationship to him, is reliable in that it's going to be there, even though it might abandon him, at least in times like this, he can rely on it. Right. So I don't know long run. I don't know if they're having these big talks about what he really needs, what he wants and how this is and, and same for her. And if it's bringing them closer together. Right. But look, she spent the day at the ER, she left the totally. ER to go to his place and take care right. of things and then come back. That's somebody yeah. that cares about you. Yeah. No, I definitely am grateful he had her for sure. I think he shows up for a lot of people. It's important for him to have people that show up for him. Right. It was really interesting to make the link because we're talking about dependence, independence, codependence, interdependence, all dependence. In terms of people and relationships, what else could he rely on? Well, he was given Ativan. And I thought it was great that he didn't even remember what it was called. Oh my God, that fantastic. made me laugh so hard. I'm sitting there, I'm like, Ativan, Ativan, Ativan. <laughs> right. Yeah, that was interesting for me to hear you guys talk about it. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. to hear you compare it to weed, in my mind, I was like, mm, I got what you were saying. And at the same time, I was like, well, I think now in the world, it's a lot more common for people to say, to say, or to actually smoke weed for anxiety. Back in our mm -hmm. day, it was really, we're just getting high. I don't think it was a real sure. big thing for that. So, and not, and either way, but it, whatever it is, something popped up for me, some sort of like, Hey kids, don't do that. Don't. <laughs> and I knew what you meant though. Yeah. I was like, oh. Right. Well, so, so what I'm highlighting for him, because we're in therapy. So I, I'm doing this and kind of taking his lead, but guiding him along. Right. Part of it is I'm making the link because the way he relies on or uses weed 
is similar to Ativan. Right. And it's, it yeah, yeah. is to bring anxiety down. He doesn't smoke weed to get high. He smokes weed, as he said before, to sleep, to quiet things down, you know, right. to mellow things out. It's very similar to Ativan. And he was also struggling with what Ativan is and why would I take it? And why am I using it? And not wanting to. And here was the cool thing for me is I, I'm starting to use a motivational interviewing piece, right? Where we look at what is it you really want? And where do you want to be? How do you want to be? And then look at what are you doing now? And is that the path to get you there? Right. Because he was so very much rejecting wanting, having the Ativan, like taking it. Like, no, no, I don't want to have it. I was like, yeah, what do you think the difference is? Sure, one's physically dependent and one's habitually dependent, like, or addictive or whatever. But I was like, right. I mean, I hear what you're saying, but you realize it's the same shit. Like you depend on something for to help with anxiety. Totally, which is why I made the link because yeah. the, as much as he's protesting out of Ann, he's using weed daily. Totally. So, oh, look, incongruent. You're protesting this thing and it's yeah. for him a big part of it and he knows it because he said it. It's this is what it's like for mom with addiction. Right. Exactly. He said something, this probably stuck out for you. He said something like, I want to be strong enough not to even have that thought yeah. of taking an Ativan, of taking something. I know. I was like, as soon as I, as soon as he said that, I was like, man, can't control your thought. And then you guys got into that right. whole thing. But I was like, I mean, I don't want to say you can't control your thoughts because you can, you just can't control the first one that pops up. The second right. one you can control, Right. Right. Well, it's what you do with that thought when it's there. And that, that's the thing that I've, I've gone through with yeah. him several times. You guys have definitely heard me say it to him. The thought arises. That's the first step that you're talking about, Mary. You can't control that. Right. The second right. step, entertaining the thought. Sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. Sometimes you ruminate. Okay. Acting on the thought, you do have control there. Yeah. yeah. So it's somewhere in that process but him saying, I want to never have that thought. <laughs> That's why I was like, that will never happen. That will never that happen. That was so funny. If He's like, oh. <laughs> right. And it's if you're holding yourself to that standard, you're going to fail. And then you're going to feel like a failure for having that thought. So as long as you're failing, you might as well then do the thing. Right. right? Yeah. And, you know, it's a, it's a whole thing. I mean, I go back and forth. Like, well, the hospital gave him nine to take home. Okay. He's literally, and I, I'm not sure exactly what this is. I, I don't know if it's, I'm not saying he's lying, but I don't know if you can stress yourself into a heart attack. If you are completely and totally healthy, that was confusing. Maybe you can. Right. 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 Sure. But also if that's the case, then I don't, I'm not blaming anyone for giving him nine out of them to take home because like, you know what I mean? I, <laughs> that seems like, okay, well, don't have a heart attack because you're stressed here. And also sometimes we all know people can be irresponsible handing out drugs that can be addictive and all that. But I think and what you said, and you gave the example of the, your client that would always keep right. one in his pocket. I keep a bottle of out with me at all times. Well, <laughs> that sounded weird. Anywhere I sleep. So like it's in my nightstand or if I go out of town, it's, I take it with me and I rarely take it, but I have it with right. me. So I know that if I can't sleep, then it is there. And that just makes me be able to sleep. Usually could be Benadryl, could be Tylenol PM, whatever. Right. And I, I gave him the example of, of my client that was like literally on stage with an Adam yeah. in his pocket. Like that's how he would perform. Yeah. And that's another version of safety net. What he was really stuck on was, I don't want to be mom. I don't want to depend on yeah. something. I don't want to do this. And he even said, I'm not worried about pounding all nine of these. I'm yeah, worried yeah. about having a dependence on these. And what I think was really telling too was he was like, I really liked that it, it helped me feel relaxed. Totally. So I'm worried that I might, I might do it. And it's- Yeah, makes you know, sense. I'm glad he's aware of it. Yeah. And it's that addictive personality. And I think this is something that you work with a lot more than I do, but I think we all have come across it, whether you're a therapist or not, that addictive personality, like something's fun. I want to do more of it or something helps me get to this place. I want to, I want that help get me there. Even, even I'm saying like, 
yeah, like I still want to do cocaine, but I'm not going to do it. Right. And there are times when I might be at a party with a bunch of people and just thinking like, oh man, be nice. If we had some Coke right now. This would be great, but right. I'm not really going to do it. And I don't want to do it. Right. right. It's that addictive personality and that tendency, especially knowing his mom's history where he's like, nope, don't want to do it at all. Right. Yeah. I'm wondering your, your brain, what your take on all that was addictive personalities. I think he definitely has one. I mean, without a doubt, his work, his, if he stressed himself into a heart attack, cause he basically life work, whatever. And then when the, the doctor said like, you need to slow down, he was even like, meh. He wasn't like, I am right. definitely slowing down. He was like, I like my lifestyle, like the way it is. And, and right. I know what I'm signing up for kind of. And also like, okay, I need to, I know I need to slow down, but it was very, there was no like, oh yeah, I'm putting on the brakes. I just had a fucking heart attack, which right. I mean, I'm glad he's being honest, but like, fuck man, really? Right. And I didn't want it to be a black and white thing where he's like, I can either slow down and, and relax and, and live a good life, or I can continue doing what I'm doing. And it's going to be a lot of stress and I might have another heart attack and I'm Mm -hmm. And he even said it like making adjustments, but that's, that's where I threw back in him that idea of going to Canada to go fish. Right. Doesn't have to be that extreme to slow down and it can be metaphoric and, and figurative. You don't literally need to go to Canada and fish and be away from LA and away from fashion. And it's what is, what is relaxing to him? And it's, it's different than a lot of a lot of clients and people and friends and I mean anybody I talk to will have a tough time distinguishing. They'll think, "Oh yeah, I was really productive today. It felt great. Yeah, I love working. It's so relaxing when I'm working and in the zone." Okay, right. That's still work, and it places stress on you that you don't realize because it's fun. One of the first times I was in a recording studio, I was there. I think in the room for maybe 12 straight hours without breaking to get Damn. food or going to the bathroom because it was so fun. I'd never been in a studio doing my stuff. And it was like, I was a kid in a candy store. Like I just wanted candy and candy, candy until I passed out. Right. And right. eventually like, I just kind of realized, wait, I got here like at noon, it's midnight. Oh my God. I think I'm beyond having to pee and hunger. <laughs> oh, right. I guess I should have eaten something at some point. And right, maybe we had right. snacks in there. I don't remember, but you lose sight of everything. It's, it's not relaxing. It's doing something fun. That's fulfilling. Yeah. I mean, and when you talked about fishing in Canada, I think you said, even if you went and did that right now, you might be like, where's my phone? I have no Wi-Fi." you know, like, could <laughs> right, you even right. just be, you talk about the human doing versus the human being. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think this is kind of the wake up call for him. I hope to look oh, at no. what does that, what does that mean? Well, I, I mean, a lot of him, he would describe himself as like, I'm, I'm, I'm go, 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 you know, snap, 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 24 seven, always yeah. on, always on. That's not what he's saying right now. All right. You know, he's kind of going, Oh wait, I can't do that. Okay. Good. I hope so. We'll see. I mean, he could, he could keep trying it, keep going. He's real young. I know he's 26. Well, he's, he's got on Cobra. He's got insurance. So, you know, whatever you can do it. <laughs> I really do believe when he says he needs to make some changes. And on the one hand, we're talking about lifestyle. On the other hand, he's looking at what his community is. You know, we've been yeah. talking about it for a while now, his family of choice, the people around him. And right. much as we might sit here and go, well, girlfriend, not girlfriend, cheated on him twice. Like, get rid of her, man. What's she doing around? She's there for him right now. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. He said something about taking a step back and people around him are just are filling in, filling in the holes. Yeah. And it's so funny because I was yeah. thinking, I think um, Sarah might have said this once or we might have talked about it with her, but maybe I made that up. But some I went when I went to treatment, when I went away, I realized the world moved on perfectly fine without me for two months. Nobody right. stopped existing. Everybody kept going. I was like, what right. the fuck? So yeah, people fill in the holes when you take a step back. They just will. They probably won't step in, up and fill them in if you're if you have them all full. If all your hands are covering these right. holes, like right. otherwise, 
cool. Then I don't have to do anything. Great. Wonderful. Everybody's right. doing right. Yeah. And people eventually think they're being taken advantage of. Mm-hmm. And it's, well, okay, but you're the one that doesn't have a boundary. Like if you, right. if you stop filling all the holes yourself, then other people will step up right. or adjust. I mean, we think about it and we talk about it to other therapists about taking time off. Like, oh no, I can't. I have 16, 20 people that all count on me every week. Like, okay, but can you take a week off? No, no, no. I couldn't take a week. What about two weeks? No, definitely not. Definitely not. Yeah, that's me. They will fill in their holes. They will live. Even if if we take a break from the podcast for a few months, I mean, you guys might be bummed because we're just so entertaining, but yeah, it's, uh, we'll it's be something sad. where you will listen to something else. You will find something else and you guys will right. be fine. We're not going to do this podcast forever, right? Maybe. It's not going to be, <laughs> you never know. <laughs> Could be 16 different clients. So you had 16 episodes a week for, I don't know, but it, it's it's something that he even said it because he's experienced loss of friends in his life and family, life goes on. Yeah, it does. And he's even said, yeah, when I'm gone, life will go on. I get it. it. Well, it does. Right. So taking a break, it's odd that we, we don't like to take a break, but yet we kind of, at least for Drew, recognize, well, if he's gone, life will go on. Right. Okay, what about if you slow down? No, no, that's not okay. Yeah, no right? way. I have to wait till I'm gone. <laughs> right, right. Well, we are going to be gone and life will go on. Yep. Until We're going to be gone week. right now. One, two, three. <laughs> Bye. Just kidding. You know, next week, right? We're going to be gone right now. Bye. Next week, my mom is breaking down the Drew episode with me. I think we're going to so put excited. it on the main podcast. Ooh. So, you guys, I don't know. You'll get it in both places or something. I don't know. That sounds we'll excited. See. Exciting. It was, it was, it was fun. She was a little stiff at first, but she kind of got into it. And then as soon then as you we handed finished, her, a, handed her a fat blunt and she <laughs> was, was like, I, like, why can't I be more like Meredith? Well, here's a shot of tequila, mom. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and an Ativan. Funny. Yeah. She was, she was very much like, I want to do it again. Like, okay, well we, we just finished. Oh do you want to do another did. one or do you want to redo that? She's like, well, do you think we should redo it? I'm like, no. Like, well, can we do another one? Maybe. Oh, <laughs> yeah. that's so cute. Yeah, she loved it. She loved oh, it. It yay. was a lot of fun. Yeah. Awesome. I'm yeah. excited to hear. Okay. Groovy. Uh, we right. will be back at you. Well, you won't. My mom will. My mom and I will be back at you next week. Yo we mama. will be back with you shortly after that. Yo mama. <laughs> <laughs> no disrespect, Mrs. Oh, Freeman. Oh, man. Don't start me on the, the yo mama jokes. Yeah, was, yeah, no. Okay. First, We're going like, bye. <laughs> Darn it. All right. Okay. Bye. Bye.